Sunday School and those that um, are listening to us by way of internet right now, we welcome you and um, we would love to have you join us for the morning service. Begins at 11 a.m. and you would just make us feel honored if you would make the trek and uh, come here and be part of the morning service. So uh, we're going to begin as we normally do. Um, we're going to go over some of the prayer requests that um, we have been praying for. Um, some were newer um, just in the recent days and then see if there's any other uh, prayer requests um, that need to be uh, brought up. One new one um, is actually um, Hannah Dorrell's significant, very significant friend, AJ, AJ Ward. Um, his parents are on the staff at Pensacola. He needs to have some surgery done. They're hoping they can get the surgery done tomorrow, but it's up in the air as to whether it's going to happen tomorrow, but he's pretty incapacitated right now. Um, so be praying for A.J. Ward for, uh, it's a hernia surgery, that that can get done and, and make a quick recovery. Um, we want to continue to pray for Connor. I was going to ask if anybody knows the update on Connor, how he's doing. I don't know what kind of surgery. He's doing good. I got another question for you. How is Darlene doing? How's your aunt doing? Ah, that is just that COVID stuff. Okay, so let's continue to be praying for Darlene Mint Lighter. And then um, if Pastor Lane was here, I'd be asking him how Pastor uh, Tobin's doing. He's um, in hospice care, uh, cancer. Um, we want to continue to be praying for Matt and Mary Zapp. Uh, I spoke with them. Kelly? Yes, I have a friend that's recovering from cancer. That he was progressing good. Okay. And if we could say some prayers to Andy Miller. Andy Miller. So he's um, right now recovering from cancer? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we will do that. Um, so continue to pray for Matt and Mary. I talked to um, Ed yesterday and... Um, Mary's doing pretty good. Matt's making progress. Maybe he'll be able to go back to work this week. But if you've had COVID, you know it's like uh, one day you feel good, next day you're not feeling so good. My wife and I have really felt that experience. Um, Joel Ward has his uh, cornea transplant um, this week. That's a big deal. And uh, it's first of, I think, two eyes that eventually get done. So you, if there's a lot that goes into it, let's be praying for Joel about this. Um, continue to be praying for Pam Brewer, for Roger Burris, um, for Orly McLouth with that broken ankle, and um, other prayer requests. Other prayer requests. I'm really hoping we'll see Jeff and Paul Elena. If Jeff is still back in this side of the state right now, hope we'll see him this morning. But we've been praying for, for them uh, in the passing. Really, we could say graduation uh, to heaven. That's a wonderful place to go. So other prayer requests. Okay. Rosie? Yeah. Um, my back and hips still ain't no better yet. Still okay. a little bit sore yet, but... Okay. They're getting, they're getting there. All right. got to quit uh, those snowboarding and skiing. Um, but, all right. All right. I had a prayer request back here. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I want you to add my mom to the prayer request. She's on the prayer seat, but um, she has um, a blood disease, and um, It's Mrs. Perf Percival. Percival. Yes. Janet is her first name. I know she would appreciate that. Well, that's good. She's going to her church now. Good. good. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Kelly? Yes. Me, me and Jesus got me down to two cigarettes a day. And, um, that's a big I deal. She will help me uh, on the last two. Really, really, I'd like to put them on of my life. 
That would be, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, Brother Ward, we mentioned about Joel and the surgery this week. Uh, amongst the other things, the Lord's heard all these petitions going up. Would you open us in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name today. We are so thankful that we're here, we're safe, and we've got the freedom to meet here to worship, Lord. I'm just thankful for everybody that's here. I pray you bless each one. Those who may be traveling yet, have a safe journey here. And most of all, Lord, may we love like you love and live like you live. May we follow you and uh, bless all of us and bless the, our teachers today and the sermon to come in the morning service. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I got to do what everybody needs to do, put that phone on silent so I don't get caught short. I heard that Ken Mace, I'll just mention this too, that he apparently sprained a leg, uh, pulled a muscle, something, and is having a hard time walking around. So keep, keep Ken in, in, in your prayers as well. So um, this week we will finally begin to examine and I pray cherish our church covenant for the role it has in uh, cultivating and prospering and preserving the unity of diversity, uh, which was designed by Christ uh, for the local body uh, of Christ, some Community Baptist Church. Um, and um, each week I'm going to try to make sure that I sort of say one or two little things uh, quite consistently because it helps to hammer it in for us. And, and that is this, just a reminder that at some point, if you're a member here of Community Baptist Church, you entered in with all of us as we begin to be members here into a, a pledge that we find um, here in the church covenant, or this is just, this is all of it, but there's the covenant and uh, but where we basically said that we solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. And what I'm going to start doing today in, I would say it's sort of like in a piecemeal um, uh, way, is to start looking at the substance of our church constitution. And um, for us to really cherish this, I think, one, we ought to look and see, is there a scriptural root to these different expectations that we've all sort of agreed to abide by? And uh, I wanted to read the first, uh, or really it's the second paragraph in the, in, the, in the covenant, but it's really the first paragraph that starts to talk about these expectations. And, um, and therein we'll find what uh, our lesson's going to touch on today. But it reads this. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. So that's just one part of what we've entered in uh, together and saying, we're, best we can, we're going to try to uh, uh, live up to these expectations. In fact, do what we can to actually perform these expectations. And so I want us to focus on one of the very first things I find in that second paragraph. And that is we've, we've pledged with the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love. To walk together in Christian love. And as I thought about this, I thought, I didn't really put this together. That's just how sometimes these lessons sort of 
uh, have a natural segue, but I thought, man, how appropriate that in the last two Sundays, we did touch on love. And we looked at really the most important form of love, um, and that is the, what the, uh, is described as the agape form of love. This is the Christ-like form of love as opposed to phileo love, which is for, more fraternal, and the eros type of love, which hopefully some of you, you know, demonstrated this past Valentine's Day, okay? Um, but there are differences, and this is really, uh, this is the superior form of love, and this is the kind of love that unites us and keeps us together in good times, but also in those troubling and hard, hard times. But I thought, boy, that, that, those previous two lessons really did help to sort of give us this foundation, and, and last week I invited or encouraged all of you um, to, to go look at 1 John chapter four and read those verses that we read in an earlier lesson seven through 21 and meditate on the enormity and really the eternality of God's love which should then prompt us when we see his example should prompt us to love God and to love one another so now with this background, this information as a background, I wanted to further anchor um, scripturally the importance. Where, where does this walk together in love come from? Well, I can't read the minds of those that put this covenant together uh, back in the 1970s because my wife and I were attending another church back in the 1970s. But I think I found at least one scriptural uh, root for that expectation in Ephesians 5. If you go to Ephesians 5, and we'll touch on that, and then we'll be in Ephesians 4 uh, for some of this. We might uh, bounce over to Galatians briefly, but mostly we're going to be in the book of Ephesians um, for this lesson. Ephesians 5, and I want to read verses 1 through 2 and see if you catch what I think is one of the anchors, scriptural anchors, to this covenant expectation to walk together in Christian love. Verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Verse 2, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So, verse 2, and walk in love. And so, one of the things that I wanted to do, because this could be a series of, it, of itself, um, but if we're actually going to cover our church constitution um, and then give opportunity for whoever pastor wants to put up here um, at bat. Um, I can only spend so much time. So, so there are some thoughts that I would like to share with you about this walk in love. And it begins with this. <laughs> it begins with us individually. We have an individual responsibility as um, Christians to walk in a love that we could say imitates his love shown towards us. And then corporately, which is really the subject of this lesson, by covenant, we together are to display as we come together that superior form of love to each other, to our visitors, and, uh, and to those that we associate with, whether it's just at lunchtime and we're served by somebody, the love we show to them, um, or to our family, our friends, and so forth. So this is not the type of love so readily on display in this world. I would suppose that if I had to single out What's the most dominating form of love, as they would call it? It'd be more of the eros type 
of love, except that it's not really, if you will, the biblical tone of that love. But as we'll see here, it's that worldly form of love um, that is not one that builds up, that encourages, that cherishes, but one that's basically a very selfish form of love. Pastor Lane. Uh, by the way, Eros is not found in the Bible. It is a lustful, in most times, it is a lustful type love, fulfilling our own desires. Right, that's right. And we're going to find that in such words as lasciviousness, for right. example. Um, which I'm going to touch on a little bit. Yeah, it's not, uh, it, it is not a scriptural type of love right. per se, yeah. but the Bible recognizes that that's the world, that right. that's the type of love, that's what distinguishes us. So actually, good point for me to lead into this, um, that the walk in love that we find in the Bible sets the redeemed in Christ apart from all others. And it's regardless of, as I put here, age or gender or nationality or race, sex, religion, wealth, status in life, the good works that may be performed, or even the amount of money. It has nothing to do with this type of love. Nevertheless, for the redeemed in Christ, this walk in love begins first with baby steps. And it does not begin, the Christ-like type of love does not begin until there's a change with us. And that change begins at the point of us being quickened from our sins, from the dead man that we were, and by receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the word of God and the spirit of God brings, is the only source that can bring that conviction to show us who we really are, which is really nothing that ought to be displayed, ought to be, is nothing to be put on a pedestal, but rather in showing us our condemnation from the eyes of a holy God also provides to us the abundance gift of redemption, of forgiveness of sins, salvation. So that regeneration, if you will, that renewal, if you will, that begins first when we turn from our ways, from our sinful ways, and we turn unto Christ in uh, being born again. So, but it begins with baby steps. I, I, I'm not aware of anybody but maybe you are, but I'm not aware of anybody who uh, got saved, gets saved, let's say, we'll just use the present tense, gets saved today and instantly tomorrow is demonstrating um, that fullness of Christ-like love. Uh, it, it begins with baby steps. I mean, by the way, that's why we have a pastor. That's why we have a pulpit. He's to preach. He's to teach. He's to edify. He's to give us instruction and at times reproof and correction to help mold us so that we are, as I'm going to say a little later, putting off some things and putting on some things. And a lot of it has to do with then how it develops that Christ-like love. And it's, it's a lifetime journey. It's a lifetime journey. Um, I, I would not want to be a person trying to stand here and say, oh, I've, I've apprehended. I, I, I've arrived. <laughs> My wife, <laughs> she's shaking her head. No, I haven't arrived yet. And, um, but I think it is a journey. And I am continuing to learn, even though I've been saved more than 50 years, uh, I have so much more to learn, to apply, and, um, and God's going to continue to use pastors and teachers and godly friends, godly wife, to help sort of groom me, to cultivate me, so that with time, passing of time, I continue to somehow take on more of that Christ-like love. And, but for us, as I was trying to say, it begins with baby steps. So we have to, we have to understand that as people get saved, 
They don't instantaneously become, you know, this, this exemplar of what a Christian can be. Uh, no, we, we have to give them a little time to start changing in those ways. And, and as I'm now going to say, a lot of it has to do with helping them through God's, uh, 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 God's word and, and the Holy Spirit and godly teaching and counsel to put off, as the Bible said to even us, to put off our former conversation, our former life, which was uh, dead to anything that would be Christ-like. Um, and put on, the Bible says, the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, which I draw from Ephesians 4. So if you're right, still got your finger in Ephesians, let's look at a few verses in chapter 4. I want to start reading uh, in verse 17, and we're going to take it to the end. So much more could be said, but I would be remiss if I couldn't read at least these verses and let God talk to us about this change that's taken place for many of us. Verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling has given themselves over unto what? L unto what? Lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. Now what is that? Let's make sure we have a, a, a common understanding. What does that word mean? Is that a good attribute to have? <laughs> Why not? Because what does it normally mean? Of the world, okay. I want to get even drilled down more. Give me one or two words that just like immoral cause... Behavior. What? Immoral behavior. Immoral behavior, okay. One word, lewd. Lewd. And from everything that I understand about lasciviousness, and I think uh, I'm looking at a lot of mature Christians, I think you'll, you'll agree with me, it always seems to have a sexual overtone to it and folks it's pretty lewd out there and there does not seem although I'm not trying to uh, say this factually but in my mind it does not seem that I can turn on any news report or read online which I like to do a lot of reading online I can't look at Fox News for example and see what's happened today and not be confronted with lewd behavior and misconduct. I, I was just reading some between yesterday and today, and I wouldn't repeat it today. I wouldn't repeat it. It's just downright despicable stuff. And, uh, but yet, let me continue. That is really what separates us, ought to separate us, from really the ways of this world. Um, and by the way, I should say, in verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves. It's When you talk about who being past feeling, what that's really saying is, is they're calloused to this stuff. They are, des in the nicest way they might say, desensitized, but really, they're just callous. They just don't care. Apathetic. Apathetic. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm actually upset that we used to look at Fox News as being sort of our conservative, they'll tell the truth, but you cannot go to those websites without seeing trash, right. trash. And I'm like, why is that news about who's doing this with whoever? I mean, it's trash. But you know why, they, I think the reason why they do it is because there's an appeal to it. And people, it, 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 it reaches out to people and they find some satisfaction in it. 
And I was just reading, again, I'm going to leave this very generic, but just this week, there's articles about school teachers and what they've done to their students. <laughs> I'm like, that person would have had to run to another country back when I was a boy if they'd have done anything like that and got caught because the whole community would have cast them away. But now, it's just like, and it's not, and it used to be, well, we could say it's some, you know, dirty old guy. Now it's dirty old women that's uh, doing this stuff. Well, anyways, we've become very, I hate to say it, but even us, we've become sort of desensitized that that's the world we live in. But that's all the more reason why we're to be different. I'll continue on. To work all uncleanness with greediness, finish in verse 19. But here's, here's where the change is. Verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. Therein, you've not learned this from Christ. If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That ye put off. Concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is what? Corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that or building up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice. With all malice, by the way. If you don't get the gist of that word, well, that's a word that's very important to us in law enforcement. That's really motivation. What was the intent? Why are you doing it? We, we need not to have this malicious intent. We need to put that away. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So the more we put off and the more we put on in our walk in love demonstrates our maturity or we could say our sanctification. Us being now set apart uh, for service, and for testimony of the holy God who has redeemed us. And we're to, we're to basically do everything we can to separate ourselves then from the former ungodly, the former unholy walk and destiny, what we used to be uh, called to until we were saved, and called to the newness in our mind for our walk and for what our future destiny is. When I thought about this, I thought about uh, Romans 12, um, and you guys know these verses very well, but let me just read them um, about this newness. Verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
Now, while so much can be said about our call to be followers of God as dear children um, and to walk in love as Christ also hath, hath loved us, which we read from uh, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, I've singled out several distinctives uh, of uh, this walk that um, I think can be very helpful even very therapeutic for maintaining the unity of diversity here at Community Baptist Church. And again, just for refresh, refreshing what we're talking about when we talk about diversity, we're talking about that we all, uh, w this church has been equipped by the will of the Holy Spirit with talents and gifts that when we offer what God has equipped us with, um, when we offer them to one another, to this church even, this church can be a very vibrant, very functional church, a great testimony for the Lord. And just on my way uh, to church today, uh, we saw, we passed the church bus. We normally meet Adam as he's driving south in M15. And, um, and I said something to my wife. Um, I said, you know, where would we be without Andy Rieger? Where would we be? Uh, the bus has been a little bit of a, a lemon. It was a wonderful bus to buy. And as I thought about it before COVID, that bus was really getting used. Because we, we had a very active, um, I forget what we call it. We didn't call it old people's group. <laughs> what did we call it? Uh, joy group. Joy group, yes. <laughs> yeah, there's no old people here. <laughs> <laughs> well, some might be teetering that way, okay? But I ain't teetering that way. <laughs> but anyways, but that bus was really used. But boy, without Andy Rieger, that bus would have spent more time than not inside that bus barn back there because it just seemed to break down with anything and everything, you know? Uh, but there's a talent. God gave him a talent that he definitely did not give me. Yeah, if you'd have saw me trying to replace an air filter in our Silverado truck this past week, I was having a hard time walking Christ-like walk. <laughs> and I still got a few little scars right here, sores there from reaching down. I mean, I was dropping stuff. My wife knows I ended up with a portal flashlight dropping all the way down through the engine. And then what do they got to put under those engines? Some type of a protective cover. And there it is, shining back up at me. And I'm like, how am I going to get that bugger out? One thing after another. But Andy Rieger, he can make these kind of things easy. Well, that's just one example. We all have been given gifts. And boy, when they're used, they are a true blessing. And I hope to sort of pick on a few people over the coming weeks yet about whose gifts have made a difference for all of us. But I say that just to help us think about that, uh, that, that diversity is needed here. The first distinctive is embedded in verses uh, 1 through 3 of chapter 4, Ephesians 4. So let me read those, and then I'll pull that one distinctive out. Has all something to do with love, all right? So you can at least keep that in the back of your mind as we're reading these verses. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, that one distinctive that I think is truly something that can help us conform our, our, our love, if you will, our behavior is that right there it's called forbearing. Forbearing one another in love. And I look back to see what Daniel Webster had to say about forbearing. I had a general... Ah, general awareness about it. We don't use that word too much. You might find the word forbearance in some type of a financial uh, 
contract where there might be some, they might use that word with some language about, you know, if you miss a payment, there may be some forbearance, you know, but you will, you'll pay a penalty, of course, if you miss that payment. But when I looked at the word forbearing, uh, Brother Webster said, seizing, pausing, withholding from action, exercising patience, and indulgence. And by the way, the, um, the opposite of forbearing or forbearance, we could clearly see demonstrated in Canada. There was not a lot of forbearance there. I mean, they're actively arresting a whole bunch of people and seizing stuff and frozen bank accounts. I mean, I know that their freedom is a little different than our freedom. Their form of government is different than our form of government, and I'm thankful for that. But I will say that when you see stuff happening like that there, do not think <laughs> that that can't be done here. And it happens just like that. They just basically turn a switch, and you don't have access to things that you thought was yours. All right, so with that as a background, Paul in his letter to the saints at the church at Colossae instructed them in chapter 3. So why don't you go over to Col Colossians chapter 3. Can I yeah, please. Uh, the difference between forbearance and patience. Patience is putting up with circumstances, going through tough circumstances. Forbearance has to do with people, going, uh, dealing with tough people. Okay. Is that the difference between forbearance and forbearing? Because you said patience. Yeah. Because okay. patience would be part of that. But patience, the word patience in the Bible is talking about circumstances like you've heard of the patience of Job. Yes. But anytime you hear of forbearing or forbearance, it's talking about dealing with people. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yep. So you folks be forbearing with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So Colossians chapter 3. Think about again that part of, of this change, these baby steps, begins with putting off and putting on. And we find this forbearing one another included in something that we're going to read here. But first, let's talk about putting off. In Colossians chapter 3, and let's read verses 5 through 9. Let's do that. 5 through 9, chapter 3. Mortify, that is, make dead, if you will. Therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, these things, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, or that is desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You believe that, folks? Covetousness is idolatry? Oh, yeah. You can tell where a person, what they relish most in life based on what they tend to spend their money towards or what they tend to make sacred in their garage, maybe, um, or in their home. For which thing's sake... The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also, he says, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. So there are things that we are to continually target because we see them surface. And we say, that's not how it's supposed to be. That's how maybe I would have been before coming to know Christ as my Lord and Savior, but he's given me a renewal in my mind. I have to be changing to be more Christ-like. Oh, some of these things, when they start to surface, I got to say, that, that's not good. Lord, forgive me. And I need to move away from that and move into putting on things that will help demonstrate my change. So let me show what putting on can be. Verse 10, and we'll read uh, down through 13. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 
where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, in other words, really foreign, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, 12 and 13. Put on, well, I'm going to go to 14 now that I see this. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man hath a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on what? Charity. That's always superior. Put on love, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness. So I suppose the best examples of forbearing one another in love that I've witnessed, because I wanted to think about some application here, and you have to sort of uh, maybe ex just sort of follow, I hope, some of the examples that I've been able to see sometimes where I believe it's forbearing one another, and they really do hearken to what you were sort of applying because they really do talk about people when I've seen it demonstrated. Um, and I, I feel that in all the years I've been a deacon, at three different churches, this being the third church. And it goes back into the 80s, mid-80s, I suppose. And I guess when I think about forbearing one another in love, the best examples that I've come away with over all these years is what I've seen demonstrated by godly pastors and godly deacons. Not sure I was always a godly deacon during some of those, but I saw, I've seen a lot of forbearing one another. So, for example, at one of the churches, actually our first church where my wife and I were married, um, I was, a deacon was also a trustee of a Christian school. We had a large Christian school, pretty good sized school back then. Um, and we would have to deal with all kinds of things to include somebody's not paying their tuition or somebody owes us for books. And at some point, the principal of the school has to bring this to the board and say, what do we do? They're, they're in arrears, six months, seven months. We've entered new school years, and as I recall, we had people still owed on a previous school year. What do we do? And uh, that might be one. Or undoubtedly, you are, you're going to have a student, as my wife and I would say, Boy, sometimes that student was the son or daughter of one of your most faithful church members. <laughs> and they get into trouble. And they keep getting into trouble. And um, it finally becomes a board matter, like a board of education, right? Well, just with that particular example, debts and student misconduct, I can just say, ultimately, did we have to sometimes make decisions and say, you have to start making payments, and we'll help make a payment plan, but you're going to have to start making payments, so you're going to have to, you can't send your kids here anymore. Um, most of the time, that decision came after we reviewed as everything we could, and after many many weeks and many board bent meetings. So month after month. And we have just find that there's another reason why no effort's being made to pay. Um, or sometimes we would try to take into consideration, because at a Christian school, you're going to have, you're going to have kids there from many other sources. And some are from families that don't even go to church. But they had the wherewithal to know better and say there is something better about a Christian school. Um, and by the way, bad things happen in Christian schools like they do in public schools. And my wife and I could tell some whoppers of some stuff that would be, oh, you sure they weren't going to a public school, those, those students, when they did this or that? No, they're going to a Christian school. But we would, we would bend over backwards, I guess what I'm trying to say, and, and, and try to work with families and help them um, because out of love. 
We, we wanted to be, to show that Christ-like love. Well, then there are other examples, and some of you have been pastors, and, and you've, you've seen um, all uh, that, uh, all that, what I've just said in different ways. But um, let me see, am I missing something here? I know I'm missing something. Bob, yes, yes, thank you, please. Uh, when Dr. Tim Jordan always said, you even had to forbear with the worst bugger in the church because you need him there to keep you honest. Yeah, could be, you know, could be. You know, and he said, you know, whether you like it or not, God's got him there for a purpose for you to help him and him to help you. Yep, and the only time that you start thinking differently is when they become a bad um, influence. When their continual misconduct is now going to uh, invite others to do it. And that's when the pastor has to say, that's enough of that. And really, as I thought about the other two churches to include here, I mean, the, the pastor deacons, um, they sit behind closed doors and they talk about some pretty sensitive things. And I have seen tears shed, especially by our pastors who love their congregation, they love their flock, Amen. and do just about anything and everything where to try to appeal to that person as to why divorce would be wrong or why faithfulness is important Amen. in being here in church and, and so forth. I think that's been over the years the best examples of what I've seen personally, of forbearing with that Christ-like love coming right from within the pastor, you might say your core leadership. They've been wonderful examples for me. But in all of these generalized examples that I've witnessed time and time again, there is a desire to seek a godly resolution to give deference when possible to the member, to patiently but constructively seek reconciliation and restoration. In other words, I have witnessed, as I said, a lot of humility, a lot of compassion, and rare, if I could even think of it, I don't know that I've even thought of an example where there was this, this instantaneous, boy, are we going to get him? Or get her. I don't think I've ever witnessed that. The second distinctive is part of a three verse meat, what I call a meaty sandwich. And we're only going to take one bite out of that meaty sandwich back in Ephesians 4. Back in Ephesians 4. Verses 14 through 16. We didn't read these verses because we really started with 17. But this is part of the big meaty Subway sandwich here where every bite's full of something really great. But verses um, 14 um, through 16, I want to read it and we'll see the second distinctive that I think is really helpful when we talk about that walk in Christian love. And it begins with verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, Nope, 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 nope. I'm in, I'm in uh, chapter 5. I knew that wasn't right. Verse, uh, chapter 14. That we henceforth walk, did I say 14? Chapter 4, verse 14. Let me get that right. Keep me straight. For married, yes. <laughs> <For married, yeah. laughs> That we, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying itself in love. What's the second distinctive? I think is right there in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. The body of Christ here at Community Baptist Church has a collective responsibility of speaking the truth in love. This responsibility begins first with the pastor who has a scriptural mandate to speak the truth in love, whether it is the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
or the spirit leading the pastor to edify or build up and fortify the church through biblical instruction, through reproof or correction, or even his decision to invite an evangelist or a missionary or some other person to stand behind the pulpit to preach or teach uh, the word of God. He has that responsibility, whether it's he that's doing the preaching or teaching or whether he delegates that to somebody else to stand behind there, that in all that's done, that the word of God is preached in truth with a coating of love. And as I thought about this, and, and again, I might have to deliberate on it a little bit more, but many of us have seen preachers, maybe evangelists, and we used to characterize it the fire and brimstone preaching, Amen, but you didn't feel a lot of love. Second. Pastor Lane? Read 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. Read it. You got her? Yep. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be general unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God for adventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, yeah. and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, are taken captive by him as you will. That's right. And, and what a sobering responsibility that is for the pastor. And unfortunately, we don't, we have a, we're blessed with the pastors we've had here. But you could go to other churches with even the Baptist, you know, logo out there. And they are, they are just giving you sugar. They are not giving any doctrine. They're not giving truth. They avoid the controversies. Why? Because they're afraid that people will go on somewhere else. Then they don't have enough money to pay their church mortgage or something. Um, but we see it. I mean, I commonly say this because I really believe it's very true. It's the Joel Osteen approach, the power of yeah. positive thinking. Yeah. You think positive. We don't talk negative here, you know? And that came from a Robert Schuler, by the way, who was before him, I believe. Uh, I think that's what his first name was, Robert. But the old Schuler in the Crystal Cathedral, right? Everything was all, you know. The glass menagerie. I'm sorry, the glass menagerie. <laughs> and by the way, that glass menagerie came crashing down. If you have never heard about the story of that place, I mean, they left a lot of people high and dry, and a lot of people, they owed money in the millions and millions and of dollars. And the son fought over it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the son is still out there wearing robes, if you will, well, of some sort. As well, so. But anyways, uh, <laughs> but this responsibility, by the way, as I thought about it, it's not solely the pastor's responsibility to, to, to um, uh, preach the truth in love, but it is the responsibility for every member here of Community Baptist Church, whether you teach a Sunday school class or you're um, teaching a junior church or Mrs. Forrester's class down there. Um, I mean, the CBC kids, CBC teens, I mean, we can go down the list. Uh, even the nursery, they... All of us that have some role with that, um, we have a responsibility to preach the truth in love. And perchance you think, well, I don't, I don't do any teaching, uh, so it's not really applicable to me. Really, the wholeness of this admonition to speak the truth in love is relevant to all of us here because we all have been equipped by the Holy Spirit with, with gifts that when properly used with humility and love not only keeps the church vibrant but stymies the schisms and promotes growth. It keeps the divisions away and promotes the codifying, the cohesion that just keeps us a great body in Christ. Now, the third, the third and final distinctive for the purpose of this lesson is found in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, if you want to turn there. I'm just going to read one verse for the purpose of making my points because I want to make sure I'm out on time. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 
For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. We could put our heads uh, together and create a long list of ways in which we can serve one another um, uh, here. And our list would be very, very long. And probably we could still think of some more ways. Uh, but undoubtedly, um, I will just say this. If you've been a member here at Community Baptist Church for very long, you've been a recipient of one of those acts of love. You've been served by somebody else who did it, not for anything they would get back, but they did it with that motivation, which is purely Christ-like love. And um, I would like to single out people. There's some people right, right away, I don't even have to think about it, that I know I've been a recipient of their acts of kindness, their acts of love, things that they walked uh, really intentionally out of whatever path they were in to do something uh, for me. Um, but what I really want to focus on is something that we all partake in as I thought about this. Have you ever stopped to think about our free will offering that we take up after communion? The, the, the offering that we take up for the benevolent fund did you know that that's an opportunity that we all have collectively to, to serve one another, to meet a need, a financial need particularly? Um, and as I thought about it, um, what, what distinguishes really when, when that plate's being passed, and I brought up about before intent, motivation being important, um, do we, and I, I'm going to say it, I, I know I've done it this way over years. There's been times like, um, and I try to prepare. My wife, since I'm normally sitting up here helping, my wife gets the money from me and she puts it in. But, I mean, there's been times that I guess we just did it out of uh, rote, if you will, did it just to do it. Uh, but did I do it really in love? Not knowing yet down the road, who might be the beneficiary of that financial gift that's being collected. But I do think that it drew me to think about this, that I ought to, the best way, if I'm going to imitate and display the love of Christ, that when that plate is passed, I want to give cheerfully. Whether it's a dollar or two, or five dollars. Eh, the truth is, this church has always been just very generous. That benevolent fund has always been funded. I don't know that I can recall any time where we had a need developed, we couldn't meet it. And the most recent need, Pastor just spoke about, where we found another church of like faith in, in uh, Kentucky, Mayfield, Kentucky, which was hit very hard with those tornadoes back in um, early December, November, early December. And we gave five hundred dollars uh, to help that help them help those right there in their neighborhood to and and that I was like that's a wonderful idea and 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 that and and guess what we had the money there and we got money left over because people gave but that giving Christ I believe Christ just gets honored as much as we sing songs to him and we praise his name I think he gets a blessing when we give with the right attitude even when we do this little plate being passed around for communion. Well, I've got to close, um, and I have a homework assignment uh, for you because we are going to do a rabbit trail uh, next Sunday. Um, I am going to hand out, or for, I'm going to put back, if you want, I'll pass it out. I'm giving you a website to a news article, something that I touched on last year. Remember, we talked about Roman Catholicism. Well, breaking news this past week, Bad news coming from a Roman Catholic church in Arizona. And if you've not read this article, it's truly sad. It's sad. And I want you to look at this article. And I want you to come back next Sunday. And based on what maybe we covered in those lessons last year or your new fresh um, look at the Bible, I want us to come back together next Sunday. We'll review the article.
And the title of it is, Catholic Priest Incorrectly Perform Thousands of Baptisms by Changing Just One Word, which according to the Roman Catholic Church makes all of that invalid. And so let me tell you, that's a big deal. Baptism in, to the Catholics is a big, big deal, right? And you'll remember why, but we'll talk about it next Sunday. I want you to read that. I want you to read that article. I'd like you to just pen some notes, maybe some scriptural verses, and say, what do you find troubling about this? And out of it, it's going to remind us that it is so contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I've got the, the website address. All you got to do is take one of these slips and you can plug it in. I can't give out a copy apparently without getting into trouble and I don't want to get in trouble because they may not be forbearing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love. Boy, you love us so much. And it's beyond anything we could describe. But we're the recipients of your love, and we love you for that, Lord Jesus. May you be just honored and glorified and praised in the coming morning service. We pray in your name. Amen.